Kia ora, I'm Bonnie Harrison and welcome to The Detail's Long Read. This week, a long read about a short list. RNZ Executive Editor Jeremy Rees ran the gauntlet of reading every book shortlisted for this year's Man Booker Prize, so you don't have to. The Man Booker Prize is the most prestigious literary award in the world and one of the most controversial. Jeremy Rees joins us to traverse the prize's history and read his review of reviews himself. This is Jeremy Rees on the Man Booker Prize. Sometime around breakfast on Monday, a book will be named Best Novel of 2023. It's Booker Time. The Booker Prize builds itself as the leading literary award in the English-speaking world, and there's no doubt it's among the most watched and discussed of literary prizes. It can transform the career of its winners, from moderately well-off to global names, and sell hundreds of thousands of books. There's been a strong New Zealand connection in the past, though sadly not this year. Kerry Hume won for The Bone People in 1985. It was such a strong year that the only known person to have read every shortlisted novel since the booker began 54 years ago, Bob Jackson of England, declared 1985 among the best years ever. Eleanor Catton won with the Luminaries in 2013, and Lloyd-Jones was shortlisted for Mr Pip in 2007. And last year, there was Shahan Karina Talaka of Sri Lanka. Massey Grad wins Booker Prize, pointed out the newsroom. This year, I decided to have a go at 154th of Bob Jackson's epic achievement and to read all this year's shortlisted novels in about a month. I can't really explain why I decided to lie awake for the last five weeks reading the Booker shortlist into the night. But here's what I found. Monday, you're going to see the winning book in the front window of every bookstore. It'll be a pop-up suggestion on your Amazon Kindle account. The winner is catapulted to some degree of fame. The Booker website claims the winner and the shortlisted novels are guaranteed a global readership and can expect a dramatic increase in book sales. The long-listed novels get a sticker and a more prominent place on bookstands, but the winner will attend every major literary festival in the world and will forever be known, rightly, as a Booker winner. Bernadine Evaristo, the first black woman to win a Booker Prize when she won jointly with Margaret Atwood, despite it being against the rules, quite a scandal, recalls how she was suddenly given a forum. Suddenly, I was given a certain kind of gravitas and respect and authority, she said. Everisto's book, Girl, Woman, Other, is said to have doubled its entire sales in the first five days after she won the booker. And then there's the money for the author. £50,000 is a good haul. Not as good as the Nobel Prize for Literature, which is 11 million Swedish krona. That's around 1.7 million in New Zealand dollars. But a lot more generous than, say, France's Prix Goncourt, which disperses prize money of 10 euro. That's enough for about a smashed avo for brunch. The New Zealand Ockham Awards disperse a particularly good prize of $64,000 to the winner of the Jan Medlicott Acorn Prize for Fiction. But really, it comes down to conversation. The winner will be the book many people will talk about over the next 12 months. It'll be part of conversations discussions, book clubs and sales around the English-speaking world. You or your friends or your workmates and colleagues will hear about the ideas in this winning novel and the shortlist. So who's up for the booker? In August, the judging panel releases The Book a Dozen, a long list of 13 novels written in English and published in the UK or Ireland the previous year. The authors can now be from around the world. Even making the long list is an achievement. This year, 163 books were entered by publishers. This is then whittled down to a short list of just six. 
So who are the six? Firstly, there's Prophet Song by Paul Lynch. It's a dystopian novel in an Ireland sinking into civil war. The mother, Eilish, tries to hold her family together. Her husband is arrested, her son rebels, and she has to make some terrible choices. Family is also at the centre of The Beasting by Paul Murray, a funny, tragic novel of an imploding Irish family in the 2008 economic crisis. It was my personal favourite. Yes, it is long, but it's so tightly constructed that you have all the answers to the riddle at the heart of the book by the end. Probably the hardest book to categorise, though, is Study for Obedience by Sarah Bernstein. It's a meditation on the power of obedience. A woman goes to look after her brother in an unwelcoming town. It goes wrong. But it is beautifully written. One of my other gems was Western Lane by Chetna Maru, in which a teen girl copes with grief by turning to squash. It's a lovely, gentle and humane book about a family coping with the death of the mother. And seriously, Maru's descriptions of squash are worth the price of the book alone. Paul Harding, the author of This Other Eden, was up for the US National Book Awards last week. He didn't win. He's got a second chance with his retelling of the true story of an island off the coast of Maine, USA, home to refugees when it comes under the eye of the authorities. And finally, a debut, If I Survive You by Jonathan Escoffery. The son of a Jamaican immigrant faces racism and poverty in the US. It's all told in a number of interlocking stories. But who's actually going to win? That's the big question. The critics have generally favoured four of the six novels. The two Irish novels, The Beasting by Paul Murray, The Family Saga During the Economic Crisis, and Prophet Song by Paul Lynch, The Other Family Saga During the Civil War. Both have good reviews. Likewise, This Other Eden by Paul Harding, about that refugee community. Sarah Bernstein's Study for Obedience, The Meditation on Service, has received some very good reviews but some readers were less happy. This is a book to be dissected and analysed in a literature course, not a wider audience, said one reader on Goodreads. Sadly, trailing in the book stakes are two outsiders, Western Lane by Chet Maru, The Lovely Little Story of Grief and Squash, and If I Survive You by Jonathan Escoffery, The Linked Stories of Jamaican Family in Florida. Both are debuts. The New Zealand listener has listed two of the books, the Beasting and Prophet Song, in its books of 2023. And RNZ has reviewed the same too, favourably. But besides the critics, it's always worth checking out the people whose job it is to actually make money from competition. It's a job for them. The bookmakers. And they have steadily shortened their odds, putting Prophet Song as clear favourite, while the Beasting has slipped down the rankings. After that, the betting money is all over the shop. Sportsbet has studied for obedience, second, the beasting and this other Eden, third equal. Nicer odds says this other Eden, second, the beasting, third, and study for obedience, nowhere. William Hill, the big British bookie, likewise has Prophet Song as favourite. Mind you, it's also offering bets on the Time Person of the Year cover. At the moment, that's Vladimir Zelensky ahead of Elon Musk for those interested. Sadly, Western Lane and If I Survive You are the long shots under every betting scenario. So it all proceeds smoothly then? Well, hardly. The great joy of the booker is not just the novels. It's the highly entertaining literary spats and occasional odd choices. And there have been some doozies. Unfortunately, 2023 doesn't feel like such a year. In 1994 when James Kelman won for How Late It Was, How Late, one of the judges called the novel Frankly Crap, although delightfully the New York Times translated this as unreadably bad, and said awarding it the prize was a disgrace. The London Times literary critic, Simon Jenkins, called the book literary vandalism, and Kelman was an illiterate savage. 
there are few things as savage as a good literary disagreement. Two years later, one of the judges from 1996 called the prize a pile of crooked nonsense. They said the winner was determined by who knows who, who's sleeping with who, who's selling drugs to who, who's married to who, and whose turn it is. She rounded off by saying, I read the 300 novels and no other bastard did. One of the judges disagreed. Sadly, he said, I was anticipating champagne and cigars and £1,000-a-night escort girls, but absolutely nothing was forthcoming, he said sorrowfully. More recently, there were more headlines when the judges, forsaking the rules, split the prize between Bernadine Evaristo, the first black woman to win, and Margaret Atwood, an epic fail which diminished both writers harumped one former judge. Apparently the uproar in the room when it was announced was so loud that it drowned out protesting Extinction Rebellion protesters outside. Now most years there's at least one boycott the booker story. The books are too readable, they're too unreadable. The prize should be British, it should be global. The sponsors are wrong, there's no place in the modern world for prizes, and so on. And there have been upsets, and then upsets. Chief among the years when the favourite didn't win was probably 1984, when J.G. Ballard's Empire of the Sun was considered such a shoo-in that betting was suspended. There was general shock when Hotel du Lac by Anita Bruckner was announced. To be fair, predicting the booker can be hard for two reasons. The judges change every year, so there's little continuity. But also there are occasional wobbles as the prize tries to navigate between literary merit and some popular appeal. The Guardian once asked judges what their relationship had been like. It was close, said a former chair, like people thrown together by a railway accident. It's the literary balance which can cause problems. John Banville, who won for the C, once said that he hardly expected to win the prize, which in general promotes good middle-brow fiction, he said. Six years later, a row erupted over whether the prize should reward literary skill or readability, or whether that was actually just a false distinction. The then chair of the jury was criticised for saying they wanted people to buy and read the books, not buy and just admire them. And of course, there's the issue of a prize to pick the best novel. One critic called it inherently absurd to pick one book over another. So scandal has been part of the fabric of the booker from the beginning. So how did I end up reading the shortlist? I need to admit up front, this was hardly an extraordinary achievement. Of all the years of Booker shortlists, this is the year of short books. Western Lane, Study for Obedience, a lovely short novels. They're almost novellas. Study for Obedience is just 120 pages long. Prophet Song, This Other Eden, and If I Survive You are on the slim side. Only the beasting is a behemoth. I came to read them all partly due to grief. A family member was unwell, dying. I was spending hours in airports. The last few months have passed on planes, in airports and beside hospital bedsides. I've reviewed books on China, but I was looking for stories, some distraction. I happened to pick up Western Lane and I was hooked. Yes, it is about grief, but it felt good to be reading a novel again and following a story. So I decided to get through the shortlist. But I discovered I had only a little over a month left. Usually readers have about two months. I had five weeks. I needed to be disciplined. Out went scrolling Twitter in every spare moment. Instead, I would set goals of how many pages to read a day. Every bus ride to and from work was spent with the Booker nominees. One gardening weekend, I listened to Sarah Bernstein read her Study for Obedience on audiobook, which is a treat to hear her tone. I then went back and read it to make sure I stuck to reading the books as my goal. 
In some cases, I read the hard copy version and the Kindle, depending on what was easiest. I learned to love the percentage mark on Kindle to measure my progress. And if all that sounds joyless, actually it wasn't. I ended up captivated by each book and reading them for pleasure. But I read them steadily to make the deadline. I confined myself to only reading interviews with the authors after reading their book, so I approached it fresh. So mathematically, the project was to read around 1,800 pages in five weeks, or 360 or more pages a week. That's a little over a novel a week, which is a stretch for a slow reader like myself. And the bee sting accounts for a good 35% of that total. But maths is largely beside the point when it comes to books. And I've always loved the bookers. The intrigue, the spats, and the books themselves. It's been a solid list of many of the best-known modern authors. Margaret Atwood, Salman Rushdie, Peter Carey, Ian McEwan, J.M. Kutzer, Nadine Gordimer, Hilary Mantel, Michael Ondaatje, John Banville, and so on. And the bookers keep rewarding Rushdie's Midnight's Children, one of the first books to really, truly strike me, with its Best of the Bookers Prize. And there's also something fascinating about a literary award. All those smart, independent-thinking writers being given the equivalent of the School Ducks Prize. And who knows? Next year, I'll try and read all the Ockhams I've promised myself. So are there things which yoke all these novels together? Actually, it is hard to find common threads through all six novels when one writer is British, one Canadian, two Irish and two American. Though there are themes like climate change, racial differences and persecution of minorities being some, despite that seriousness of message, they are actually often surprisingly funny. The book of judges worked hard in their announcement to find that common ground. This year's chair, Essie Edugan, said they typified the unease of the moment. Although the Sydney Morning Herald felt that unease was understating the case, sheer terror swirls through some contenders, it said. Beyond that, what struck me was how vivid are the key scenes in these novels. That shouldn't be unexpected in good novels, but I was taken by how epic and cinematic they were. These are scenes like Eilish and Prophet Song, running across no man's land to reach her son in hospital, or later in a morgue, oddly happy because she can't find her son at first. Or it's seen at the beginning of This Other Eden, when the island is flooded and a character inches higher and higher up a tree to escape the floodwaters. Or the extraordinary ending of The Beasting, in which the characters all converge in a wood, in a storm. The rest of the scene I'll have to leave to you. It's a spoiler alert. These and many others were arresting. But one other thing stood out personally. All these books have forceful voices for their narrators or their lead characters, including even the study for obedience with its obedient, disconcerting housekeeper. The voices are captivating. But over time, I actually came to relish the people in the background. The people who don't say much, but still have their place. So a hat tip to the ever-decent Uncle Pavan in Western Lane, always trying to do the right thing for the girls. Or the mother in If I Survive You, who clears out early, but phones often with good advice. Or Dickie's mother in The Beasting, who's always out gardening, and by my count has just half a dozen things to say in the entire book except every single one of them is prescient. So a bookerette to the supporting cast. Finally, predictions. Personally, I would give it to the bee sting, with Prophet Song a hair's breadth behind. Two superb Irish novels. And I'd give Study for Obedience as an outlier. It's the dark horse of the bookers. 
If the judges get split in that quality, readable debate again, this is the book which could win. And that in turn will divide readers. When I tweeted how much I was enjoying Study for Obedience, even if a bit baffled by it, a reader replied, no plot, unreadable, must win. It was just about sums up the differences in opinion. It's the story, actually hardly a story, more a meditation, in which a woman goes to live with her brother, a successful businessman, in an unnamed country. It turns out the country people once persecuted the woman's forebears. The woman meditates at length as she walks or does chores. She thinks closely about her need to be obedient, her desire to be meek. She speaks to herself in these circling hypnotic sentences. And eventually her very obedience seems to rob her persecutors of their power. It's very much a fable. Sarah Bernstein is a poet who writes first for the sound of the words, so this is a very rich sounding novel. But I loved the bee sting. The story of Dickie Barnes, the V dub car store manager, spiralling downwards, his beautiful wife Imelda and their two kids. The author Paul Murray was long listed for the Booker in 2010 for his very, very funny novel of life at a private school, filled with donut eating competitions, platonic crushes, and terrible teachers. And the beasting is equally funny. But this time it's funny and desperate and tragic. The family has a secret at its heart and it's ready to sting them. There's climate change in the background too. The town is beset with once in a hundred year floods. There's either too much water or not enough. And this book is all about disaster, whether climactic or family. And slowly creeping into the novel with all its V-dub tour eggs and playstations and catalytic converters is a sense of an older Ireland and its fairy tales. The other disaster novel, Prophet Song, is my second, but probably the Booker Judge's first choice. There are so many strengths to this dystopian book. The first half is filled with dread as the mother Eilish reacts to the state crackdown. The family is tracked by the police. Her husband has disappeared. Her son runs away. The local butcher won't serve her. She's shunned at work. But when civil war breaks out, every decision becomes fraught. Should Eilish get her family out or stay to search for her disappeared men? What I think may lift Prophet Song to the booker are its final scenes. The descriptions of Ireland and even names and descriptions of characters just seem to leech away until it becomes about any war. Eilish and her family could be from Lebanon, Syria, or even now Gaza. It's a timeless, timely book. So those are my top three. But who knows? The book has been filled with surprises, and it may well be again. So the first we will hear will be the winner announced sometime at a literary event in London on the evening of Sunday, November 26. That will be the morning of Monday, the 27th of November in New Zealand. The second thing we'll hear is the sound of people arguing. Did that really deserve the booker? Yep, it's booker time. That was Jeremy Rees reading his review of the Man Booker Prize shortlist, published on rnz.co.nz. The detailed long read is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. We'll be back next week with another long read. Kaki te anō.